As everyone has probably said, it's great to see faces rather than screens. So thank you all for attending the session. Um, my name is Dominic Mano. I'm from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I work in the High Performance Computing Division. Um, I, I focus on storage research to impact our uh, next generation storage systems. Um, I'm joined today by Sean Gibb from Ideticom um, and Andrew Mayer from, also from Ideticom. Um, Sean is the VP of Engineering um, over at Ideticom and Andrew is the firmware team lead. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, some applied computational storage, how we modified a file system um, to support simulation science uh, using computational storage, <clears throat> or leveraging computational storage, I suppose. Um, so this really represents our, our first foray into computational storage, um, and I think the, the results will, will speak for themselves, and, and they're pretty impressive. Um, but I think the, the real success was sort of exploring this space um, uh, deeply and, and kind of understanding what our options were and, and going forward how, how we want to uh, implement computational storage at, at a site like Los Alamos. Um, so all of this work was accomplished across this really capable group of, of partners. Um, so we're here representing that group. Um, we came together with a common goal of exploring real world computational storage um, rather than just the theory of what could be done. Um, our primary goals were related to performance um, and, and improving performance for simulation science storage systems. Um, but like I said before, we also wanted to focus on really exploring what a, what a standards-based solution and an open source um, available modular system um, could provide um, to make it uh, easy to adopt uh, and, and kind of uh, encourage future collaborations in this space. Um, obviously, one of the requirements was related to needing um, to use familiar HPC storage stacks uh, and also try to not modify our or uh, simulation applications, sort of provide a transparent improvement to, to storage systems for them. Um, so just quickly, uh, Aeon Computing was, was one of the partners. They focused on hardware integration and meeting our hardware requirements. Um, so that was super beneficial. Um, Ideticom helped implement um, most of the offloads and helped us integrate their offloads with our software modifications to ZFS and, and a kernel module we implemented. Um, NVIDIA provided Bluefield 2 DPUs um, and a network to connect all of our storage servers up to and, and do all of the capability testing there. Uh, we as LANL modified uh, ZFS. Um, our friends from Canada here will call it ZFS. I apologize for them doing that. Um, but so we, we provide a lot of uh, open source changes to ZFS and, and created a kernel module that is also open source. Uh, and then SK Hynix provided uh, high performance capable flash. All right, so here's a brief rundown of sort of what we'll go through here. Um, first, I'll, I'll convince you that we had real motivations for, for this work. Um, we'll talk about specific HPC platforms that exist today and, and how what we did um, in the past will inform what we're going to do in the future. Um, we'll talk about HPC storage architectures, um, what the data set challenges look like. Um, but the, the main meat of the talk will be um, about the accelerated box of flash, uh, referred to as ABOF probably throughout the rest of the presentation. We'll go through the hardware, the software and then wrap up with current performance and, and what future work looks like. Okay, so we'll start with a, a brief bit of background on HPC systems um, and in some of Lionel's simulation science workloads. Uh, so represented here on the left is a, a Trinity era class of a supercomputer. Um, as if you saw Gary's talk yesterday, you, you saw some of these numbers um, that are pretty large and impressive. So Trinity has about 20,000 compute nodes, um, split roughly uh, in half between the Haswell and the KNL CPU partitions, um, so about 10,000 of each. Um, and then uh, the total amount of DRAM is roughly two petabytes. Um, so for our most mission critical job, this single job can really consume almost all 20,000 nodes, or at least what are available and up and running. Um, and so in order to ensure forward progress is made with the simulation, um, the application has to do what we call a checkpoint, which is basically just dumping the state of memory or some large percentage up to 80 to 90% of the state of memory um, out. And, and while that's happening, obviously computation can't continue, so the simulation is paused. Um, so you wanna make sure that IO happens as quickly as possible. So our first requirement is absorb two petabytes of DRAM on some frequent basis as quickly as possible. Um, I think that's got, uh, and then so if we're gonna characterize the data set itself um, for, for a given time step, so for one given dump, 
Um, it's usually a very small number of files that are, are extremely large. Um, and then, as Gary mentioned yesterday, these are floating point values in a high entropy simulation. So compression really isn't a, a super um, efficient process run on, on these data sets. Um, so if we move to the right, the blue boxes here represent um, what we would call a burst buffer. This is a scratch space to absorb that checkpoint. Um, the burst buffer on Trinity was, was sort of our first major step in resolving these bandwidth requirements. Um, the burst buffer nodes sit on the high speed network, the same one as the compute cluster. Um, they have a couple of PCIe flashcards inside, um, providing about four petabytes of capacity. Um, so you'll notice that four petabytes is only twice the size of memory in this instance. Um, so data can't live here long if we're going to absorb multiple checkpoints. Um, the throughput provided is about three to four uh, terabytes per second. Um, so extremely fast, probably one of our uh, the fastest system that Lennel's um, deployed to date. Um, and, and at this time, the, the economics, uh, it made the most sense to build, build the system this way. So small capacity, but with high, high bandwidth. Um, but because the capacity is limited in this tier, we, we can't do things like provide data protection or let data live long um, in this tier. Um, so data lives here for, for days to weeks rather than months. I'm sorry, days to one week rather than weeks to months. <clears throat> Um, and then, because this was kind of our first deployment of an all-flash file system, we sort of wanted to hedge our bet a little bit and provide a high disk, a high bandwidth disk here as well. Um, so that's kind of what this is getting at. Um, so Trinity has a disk-based Luster parallel file system. Um, there's about 100 petabytes of, of hard drive in this system. Um, because it was deployed to provide a bandwidth capability at about a terabyte per second, you kind of get all of that capacity for free. It's really too much capacity, but um, it's, it's what you get when you need to build a disk-based system for bandwidth. Um, so we are able to provide data protection at this tier. It's at the plus two parity, so nothing too crazy. Um, but data doesn't live here for, for much longer than weeks to months. Um, the, the architecture here is that two servers uh, are embedded inside of a JBOD. They kind of share the 84 disks inside of that JBOD. Um, so it's a real rigid architecture. Um, and, and then not pictured. Uh, Lennel has designed and, and built a capacity tier for longer term storage. Um, this is called campaign storage. Campaign storage. Um, it implements a file system developed at Lennel called MarFS. Um, and this is where the data is highly protected. It lives there for, for months to years um, throughout the life cycles of, of simulation campaigns. Um, and it's got two tier erasure and, and a lot of other great features that have probably been discussed here before. Um, but the point I'm getting at here is we didn't really need uh, the capacity of this system. Um, it was sort of just a backstop for the, the first implementation of AllFlash. OK, so if we, we summarize all of the lessons that I just described through the design of that system, um, we can help inform our future designs. Um, so we need to absorb petabytes quickly, um, which likely means AllFlash. Um, and even in today's realm, it means low capacity. More capacity than four petabytes, but we're still looking at less than 10, probably, or maybe just about 10. Um, and then, so because we have a limited capacity, we want to store all the data efficiently, meaning trying things like compression. Um, but like I mentioned, uh, scientific data sets don't compress well. Um, and then the, the real main focus I've highlighted here is the super, super rigid design um, and the tight coupling of storage server and, and storage media. Um, so if there's a new protocol, a new piece of storage technology or software-defined storage that we want to test out, it's almost impossible to try it out in this scenario because the, the storage servers and the media are so tightly coupled, you can't change one without changing the other. Um, you can't chop off half of your file system and, and test out some things for a little while and then put it back, um, where, whereas NVMe namespaces really start to enable that. So what we learned here is that if we're going to deploy all flash and we want to obtain all of the bandwidth, but also the IOPS that we're paying for, um, we really need a more dynamic storage layer. Um, and, and flash NVMe and NVMe over fabrics really enable that. Um, so we can accommodate, accommodate all the various workload requirements that we can think of. Um, and we can do it with mostly the same hardware. Um, so here at the top right, you can see we can scale out storage servers and storage services independently from the storage media. Um, you'll have some dedicated set of media that sits on the same network. Um, in an extreme case, it can be exposed all the way back into the compute clients. Um, or you can hide it behind the storage servers. But those two are no longer so tightly coupled that the workloads are, are locked behind something like Luster. Um, and 
So the, the two alternatives to this are something like a hyper-converged system where you put flash and compute nodes in. There may be some workloads that can benefit from that. They're certainly um, non-existent at LANL. Um, or you can sort of build dedicated islands of storage where you do this tightly coupled thing, but you build a purpose-built storage system for each workload, um, which uh, for our use case seems a little bit wasteful when we can just leverage a design like this. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on NVMe and Flash uh, impacting our designs, but this is a computational storage check, so where does computational storage fit in? Um, so as it turns out, just sticking NVMe flash drives um, in an enclosure and hooking up a server to it doesn't necessarily allow us to obtain the bandwidth that we, we thought we would get when you put traditional HPC storage stacks on top. Um, so it turns out that RAID compression techniques uh, create the need for multiple passes over memory on the storage server. Um, and once you exceed something like four passes over memory, you have now reduced the bandwidth below your available network bandwidth and, and storage bandwidth. Um, so all of those operations at the storage server uh, level really showed a need for, for exploring something like offloads and, and computational storage. Um, so as we began testing with all flash file systems, um, we realized this limit. Um, and to make matters worse, like I mentioned before, it's not like we can just turn compression off. We wanna make sure we're storing the data as efficiently as possible. Um, so any space savings we can get, even if it's 30%, is, is worthwhile when you're talking about five to 10 petabytes of storage. Um, and then the last comment about compression there is related to the quality of compression. Um, so LZ4 doesn't really provide the capability of, of compression that we need. So you need to look at something like gzip. And if you've ever run gzip on a, on a storage server, it's um, pretty mundane performance compared to, to what the flash devices can obtain. So if we quickly look aside to, to what the HPC storage pipeline is, just to kind of give you some familiarity before we go into to the nitty gritty details and modifications, um, all, of the clients know that, all the client nodes we had talked about on the left hand side have a uh, Lustre client. Um, so they just issue normal POSIX calls that the Lustre client uh, captures, sends it over the, the Lustre specific network driver using RPCs. Um, and then on the right hand side here, we have what we call the Lustre object storage server. This is where most of the data flows through. Um, so the, the server knows how to parse the L&D RPCs coming out of, of the client. Um, the Luster OST is a set of processes that interact with the lower level ZFS file system. Um, it turns out that Luster supports uh, two, two backend file systems, so ZFS and LDISC-FS. Um, LDISC-FS is basically modified EXT, so you don't get data protection features or compression or anything like that, um, which is really why we, we care about ZFS. Uh, and so that, that light purple box there is sort of where we're focused on all of our modifications um, and uh, improvements we saw. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of the capstone result that showed um, where the, the memory bandwidth limitation comes from. Uh, so here we have an AMD second gen ep epic. We also had first gen results that were much poorer than this, but it's okay. Um, and then comparing it to an Intel Platinum. Um, so that top dotted line is raw block performance to the NVMe drives, and uh, this is to 10 NVMe drives uh, using one megabyte writes through ZFS. Um, and the, the, dash, the dash line is just raw block. <clears throat> so uh, if you add something like a small computation, like a checksum, um, you get that top line, the, the dark blue and the dark green there. Um, and we see that we have some, some limits there, but uh, it's pretty small compared to the drop when you add something like RAID-Z. Um, but the real thing to take away here is when you compare RAID-Z1 versus RAID-Z2 performance, which adds computation, we don't see a change in performance at all. Um, so this means that the limitation isn't on the CPU, it's on something else. Uh, and it turns out as you, as you think through the problem, memory bandwidth becomes the, the obvious uh, problem there. Okay, so at that I'm going to hand this off quickly. Right. So um, just a quick aside before we jump into the computational storage. This is the enclosure that Aon put together for this project. In this enclosure, there's a NVIDIA Bluefield 2 DPU. There's a big tree of 
PCIe Gen 4 to the front bays, and there is a configuration where either we can have a single slot by eight or a dual slot by four. And just to kind of talk about the things that we put into these, um, into these different uh, slots. I mean, in the front, of course, we're putting in a whole bunch of Gen 4 NVMe drives. We also have a Gen 4 U.2 computational storage processor CSP implementation, which has no storage on it. It provides look-aside look acceleration through the U.2 slots, so we could slot those in to do different experiments. And in the, um, you know, the adding card, more typical adding card slot, we could put in things like uh, AMD U50, for instance, to provide computational storage services for data before, you know, as we were doing the various operations that we're gonna be digging into a little bit as we go along through these slides. So, <clears throat> Identicom is a software company. We don't have our own DPUs. We don't have our own hardware platform. So, when we, when we went through this process, we viewed computational storage kind of from the perspective of, as a software company, you know, that software might be um, RTL for an FPGA, it might be actual software written for an ARM processor or an Intel CPU or, or an AMD CPU. You know, it, it can serve many different purposes, but from our perspective, it was really how do we break down the problem to work with all the hardware pieces that we have available at our disposal, including some of our own accelerators that we've implemented on FPGA cards by, by AMD and Intel. Um, and really, as, as we look at the problem, computational storage is really kind of the answer. So the ABOF, in many people's minds, you know, might, might appear like a computational storage array. There's a DPU in there, at least in the, the implementation that we showed in this picture. And there's a whole bunch of storage under it, which may or may not be um, smart devices themselves. In this case, they were all SSDs, but there's nothing limiting us to that. You know, we could put in a smart SSDs, we could put in CSDs by other people, by other companies, you know, to provide additional computation that would be helpful. But in this implementation, SSDs by SK Hynix, um, and then our own accelerator cards. So in that way, it, it appears like a computational storage array. But inside of that array, we've got a computational storage processor. And um, coming into the box, which, uh, I'll get into in the next slide a little bit, is NVMe over fabrics. So we have NVMe over fabrics commands that we're throwing at this box, telling it what we want it to do, what jobs we want it to do. Um, so let's just jump into that. So this is kind of a review of, of the slide Dominic showed a few minutes ago. So on the side, the orange box kind of represents this ABOF. Now when we developed the software, um, we were targeting I mean, the initial concept is we're gonna target the N NVIDIA Bluefield 2 DPU, but really as a software company, our goal is to make this as hardware agnostic as possible. So we did a lot of the development in our own lab because we didn't have Bluefield 2s at this point yet on um, AMD and Intel CPUs set up with basically everything else the same in the box except for you know the DPU that's gonna run the various um, algorithms that we need to run to interpret the over fabrics commands and so forth. So really as we went through this process, our, our goal was to keep this box agnostic to the type of hardware that lives inside of the box itself. And th that even includes our own hardware for the cards that we put in. So you know, if you're gonna slot in a card that supports um, EC to help accelerate the RAID Z2. If you have it in, you know, you can test the performance, you pull the, the card out, which in this case was a U.2, and you can measure the same performance, and it just uses software in the box instead of hardware to do the job. And that goes for all of the different parts, compression, um, checksum I'll get to in a second, but we didn't, we didn't do checksum in hardware, and um, the EC. So really, we're trying to be agnostic about the accelerators that are in, in the box, the physical hardware that's in the box, the CPUs that are in the box as much as possible, um, including, in fact, using the same hardware with um, the same software with even multiple ARM vendors as well. So, you know, we tested it with an NVIDIA. We also test it with an Ampere-based ARM system. So as, as a software company, our goal really is to make the stack the part that appears the same regardless of the 
the hardware that is underlying the system, and then let's kind of see how it evolves from there. So today we'll be giving a very brief overview of this. If you want a much more detailed overview, and I'll probably say this a few times, Jason Lee from Los Alamos is gonna be giving a talk tomorrow morning that's gonna dive into way deeper detail on some of the details related to the um, way that the problem from the ZFS side was broken down. So just, just enough to cover here though, on the top we have the, the ZFS stack. I think you know, we saw it kind of earlier in Dominic's picture. But you can see that there's several jobs that we're gonna do. The order is shown here, so we're gonna copy some data. We'll do some compression on that data. In software, maybe potentially different algorithms, but in hardware, gzip. Then we take a checksum on the data. Then we'll do some RAID Z, RAID Z1 or RAID Z2 on that data, and then issue the data out to the drives. So um, Los Alamos came up with the idea that by modifying the ZFS stack, by by changing the ZF stack, ZFS stack and extracting the actual work done for these jobs from the interface to these jobs, that we could provide the ability to provide an offload layer where if you went and did something with that offload layer, provided algorithms for those off, that offload layer, you could interject hardware acceleration into the job. And um, as we went through this process, it became clear that if you're gonna be talking to an over-fabrics device, of course, the last thing you wanna do is transfer data back and forth across the network because it doesn't take very many transfers before network bandwidth becomes your limiting factor. So um, as you look at this picture, the big arrows represent the data flow through the system and the small arrows represent the control flow through the system. So when you go to do a job, you, know, you say, here's a big chunk of data that we're gonna be operating on. Allocate me a buffer, here's a big chunk of data for that buffer. Now let's go and compress that using gzip compression. And it will fire an NVMe, ultimately it fires an NVMe over fabrics command that instructs the ABOF what to do with the data. And in this case it says compress the data, put the results in this buffer. So the ABOF goes and does that, reports back, I'm done. It says okay, on this buffer do a checksum. On this buffer, do an EC job. And as it goes through this, you know, like, you know, of course there's pipelining, you can have many things going at once in the system, but at, at the ZFS level, it's keeping track of all the jobs that are in flight, and in the ABOF, it's just taking things from one buffer to another buffer, ultimately until the data gets written out to the disk. <clears throat> so, Again, this, there'll be more details on the exact specifics of this tomorrow, but it, it kind of will point to, to some of the things that I want to talk about. And I mean, there's a user application running on top, which you know is outside of our scope in a sense, but as we go down to this ZFS level, inside of that there's this, that little Zia block we showed. Now, the Zia block by itself isn't enough to issue fabrics commands because you, know, you don't want to build the API to be forced to live with NVMe over fabrics, you know, you might want to do this in a direct attach sense, so if you want to do it in a direct attach sense, then you don't want to be issuing over fabrics commands. You know, maybe someone has a Intel QAT on their Sapphire Rapid CPU that they want to use to do compression well, then you would prefer to interject the command right at the level of ZFS. Yeah. The buffer? that Z, Z off alloc buffer lives on the A buff itself. It's on the, the, the memory in the blue field. Yeah, in the RAM in the blue field, at least to begin with. That's a good question. Um, I didn't get to talk about it too much and I think Andrew will touch on this a little bit, but there is ways you could use peer-to-peer -peer so the buffers live in accelerators, for instance. Um, but at least the initial buffer is gonna be in the blue field too. Or, or the DRAM of whatever CPU is there. So because of this, you know, wanting to interject commands um, or, or intercept commands to accelerate in a way that's agnostic to whatever your storage server looks like in the ZFS, this, this layer, the Zia kind of just intersects in a very high level way. So a, um, a module was needed to be able to go and expand that out. And this is called the data processing unit service module. Um, 
And there's, there's three different kind of providers, we call them, that, that are accessible to this process. So of course there's the software provider which basically just treats it like normal ZFS. So you know, it's all gonna run right on the machine exactly as you would expect it to run. There's a null provider which is great for getting kind of a baseline, what's the fastest we could possibly get this thing going if we were doing nothing performance and kind of good debugging tool. And then there's this CSS standards provider. And the real goal of that is to um, provide a way to offload computational storage services. And I did a comp, we went and um, built the provider at that level. So I did a, uh, Lano built all of the other software that, that we've talked about here. They built the ZFS, um, the Zia, they built the uh, DPU SVC, and then we provided a provider for that that would generate excuse me, <coughs> that would generate the overfabrics commands that could be sent from the initiating device to the target devices. And again, one more plug, if you wanna get into the really nitty gritty details of how this whole software stack works, Jason Lee tomorrow at 8.15 a.m. is giving a talk on this in the DPU track. Okay, so now we'll pass off to Andrew who will talk about the, um, some of the even more specific details about the implementation. Jeopardy music as we're switching. <laughs> and Sean didn't get the memo to wear black pants because apparently that's all we're doing today. But <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't all match, that's okay. Um, anyway, so my name's, my name's Andrew, uh, I'm the firmware team lead, uh, and uh, yeah, I kind of want to go a little bit more into the uh, actual interface itself uh, between the ABOF and the outside world and what those commands would kind of look like and, and why we would want to do that. Uh, and as Dom and, and Sean mentioned, uh, really the goal is to kind of disaggregate the acceleration away from, well, disaggregate the flash storage level from the storage level. Um, so that means that we can uh, you know, we can provide offload services as kind of a black box. Uh, so if we can talk a standard interface to this box, we can then natively use the accelerators, uh, flash SSDs, DRAM, whatever else that we want to use underneath of that. That's kind of the, the goal behind this. So uh, really in between the host and the ABOF here, we have that NVMe OF um, over fabrics command set. And that's, that's kind of the basis for how we're going to access all of these accelerators. And, uh, and when I say accelerators, by the way, obviously we can use the uh, FPGA acceleration no load. Uh, we could have NVMe on the front end to an acceleration. We could have NVMe to flash devices. Uh, we could be using hard drives. We could be using SCSI. It really doesn't matter what's in the box itself as long as the box knows how to talk within itself uh, in a standard way. Um, and accelerators, of course, you could throw in a GPU. There's no reason we couldn't do you know, GPU direct. Uh, we couldn't do, we could do peer to peer between the accelerators and the SSDs, the DRAM, really kind of unlimited there. Uh, and of course, CXL, Any, and you could throw in a CXL device there. Um, but really the, the interesting part uh, that Sean kind of briefly mentioned and the, the question uh, the gentleman had was about, uh, is really about the data movement and what, what does that look like on, on a system like this? Uh, and the thing that we've actually um, created here was the, the ZI interface to talk to the MVM over fabrics, and that allows us to do the data movement in an efficient way. Um, so the user space application has that chunk of data, which it can then call through the, the software stack that it has, through ZFS, the DBU SVC, and obviously translate it into that uh, NVMe over fabrics command to tell the ABOF, hey, I want to allocate a buffer here. And then we can transfer that buffer across the network and it'll live on the ABOF. Uh, and then from that point on, the ABOF is really the owner of that data. Um, so what it wants to do with it can be controlled by the host, of course, um, but it will always live on the ABOF itself. Uh, so really between the Athena provider, which is kind of the name that we're, we're going with it, the, the provider and the module, which is the interface, uh, really the, the module is kind of like an NVMe over fabrics translator. Uh, we have these NVMe over fabrics commands in the command set that we have defined, and it's going to translate it to whatever it thinks it should be using, like Sean mentioned, do I have an EC offload hardware? Do I have an EC offload in the software? What, what should I be prioritizing for using this application? Um, so in a general sense, we would allocate the buffer first from the user space. And then the host again would have access to say, okay, I wanna use no loads compression engine and I wanna send that data right from the DRAM that lives there already to the compression engine and then do something with it. 
Uh, so we would send them to zoff compress, zoff ec uh, command back down to there to do that. Uh, and then, of course, we can send it directly via a zoff issue IO. We can send it to the SSDs. Um, but of course, we can also pipeline. There's nothing saying that we could go, we could create a command in line that says, uh, let's do compression plus analytics or compression plus EC in a single chain. Uh, we could have a, a, a command in the offset that says, okay, I want to run, send it to the DRAM and then send it to this accelerator, then this accelerator, then this accelerator, and then ultimately into the flash. Uh, and that's kind of the, the interesting part of, of having the data live there for you is we don't really have to do a bunch of data transfers to allow this to happen efficiently. So just taking a, a higher level approach again here, um, this is kind of the theory of operations from the top level. Uh, obviously we have the, the Lustre object store that we used for this specific example, uh, and it's going through its normal software stack. So in this case, we're talking to ZFS, which I was gonna say ZFS today, but now that Dom mentioned that, I think it's, <laughs> it's ingrained in there, I gotta keep doing it. Um, and the ZFS would make, uh, be aware of the ZIA, uh, which is the interface that Jason's gonna talk about tomorrow. Uh, to know that it can do offload for compression, checksums, parity calculations, and the I.O. commands. Uh, and then in that case, it would also know that, hey, that I have this over fabrics device that I can use, and it's maybe not necessarily local, but I can use it just like it's local. And the Lustre file system would have no idea that this is happening in the low end. Um, so it can essentially go through and borrow the compression algorithm, send it off to the ABOF, like I mentioned before, and then do the acceleration stack without actually transferring the data across the network every time. So this is the slide you are all in anticipation for. The performance results, what did we actually get out of this? Um, and the results are actually quite, quite good here. Um, so using the, the ABOF acceleration from uh, compression with no load and using a GZIP compression, we were actually able to get about 17x performance increase uh, as compared to using GZIP on the, on the CPU. Uh, now this is just through direct uh, ZFS writes uh, on the bandwidth going, going to the hardware there. Um, and the interesting part is this really enabled, um, on the scientific data set, this really enabled us to get about a 25 to 30% increase on storage capacity without sacrificing that bandwidth, that speed uh, that we were getting into it as if we weren't compressing. So it's, it's essentially like we're getting a native uh, transparent compression, but without any slowdowns of using the, uh, uh, the gzip software. Uh, and then of course, where do we go from here? Well, you, you heard me mention a couple times about you know, the command set for NVMe over fabrics uh, and the ZIA stuff. Uh, really, we wouldn't be anywhere without standardization in the industry. So. Um, we kind of developed this in mind with the twig that's happening right now to you know, investigate and evaluate some different ideas for what the data movement could look like, uh, what it, how, how could we actually use it in a real world application. Uh, so ultimately with the ABOF in the future, we would want to align with anything that, uh, that a twig, a future twig would come up with for a standard. Uh, so if we had that NVMe over fabrics namespace set as a standard, we would follow that going forward so that you know, we don't care if if LNL or Aeon makes this device, it's gonna be a certain device that can provide known offload uh, to the host with you know, a known data set or a known uh, instruction set. Uh, and then obviously we can iterate on the hardware. Um, so we even found, even in this example here, uh, with the capabilities that we were given, we weren't even saturating the devices yet. Uh, so adding in different you know, performance tuning for adding in more compression cores, adding in more acceleration uh, offload applications, we can even pump that number quite a bit higher. That, uh, that 12 gigabytes per second was really just kind of a baseline of, of what we had running. Uh, and then of course, as technology evolves and, and things improve, we get PCIe Gen 5, uh, we get crazy GPUs that come out, we can make use of that technology by providing different kinds of offload, different kinds of parity calculation or uh, a RAID device calculation, anything that we wanted to add there. Uh, and then uh, the kind of the Monty Python holy grail of what we'd want to get to is uh, this data aware offload piece. So, you know, the, the nice piece about everything that we've done here is that the data movement itself is very localized in that ABOF. So if we want to do intensive workloads, that's going to require doing an analytics, uh, for example, uh, we would want that data to already live on the ABOF, which it does. So if, if we have some kind of analytic capability, we can make use of that and pipeline that through as we're sending the data right to the device. And that's all I have for this. So if you have any questions, please feel free.
Come join me. Hmm? You just mentioned potential performance improvements. How much of that is going to come from software versus hardware, especially hardware that you already know is up to roadmaps? Yeah, so the question. Yeah, the question is, uh, with potential performance improvements, how much of that is going to come from the software versus a hardware improvement in the future? Uh, and to be honest, we, we don't know. <laughs> um, really, if there's really good, uh, you know, Intel QAT comes out on Sapphire Rapids, like Sean mentioned, that would be a really good software implementation that we want to explore for compression um, for or a RAID calculation or something like that. Um, no, he said you can turn it on. This one working now? No. Nope. I think another thing, um, and, and maybe Jason will talk about this tomorrow, I don't know. Um, so LANL is continuously looking at how they can improve the ZFS side of, of the stack. And, you know, there's lots of efforts that they're pursuing um, in, in improving the ZFS side of the stack because, you know, there's certainly lots of software inefficiencies that could be improved. Um, you know, and that's happens concurrently as we've been going through this process already. Some of these changes have been happening concurrently with the efforts we're doing on the hardware side. And, you know, as a software company, really, we're happy if someone can improve it without us having to go and, you know, go build a whole new piece of hardware to get the same performance that we could get by someone improving the software. And obviously the standardization helps with that as well, right? If we have more hardware devices coming up that follow the, uh, the new computational storage standard that's coming out, it makes it easier for us to consume that in an ABOF in the future. Do you have an answer? No? Yeah, any others? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So the question is, what kind of uh, metric or criteria would we use to determine the optimal location for offloading? I think I'll let Dom take that one. So I think uh, it, it's a boring answer, but sometimes it's honestly an economic question, right? So uh, it was earlier, and I don't know if I said it or, or Andrew said it, but. Um, I, at some point, we'll have fast CPUs with fast memory, and, and maybe this is all for naught, and we've moved everything back into the storage server. But having the capability to move these things around is really the big win. So I think determining the optimal location is both economic and then performance second. Right, right. So I would say cost for gigabytes per second is really the, the ultimate metric. I, we should care more about power. I, unfortunately, you saw the 10, 20,000 nodes that takes up more power than anything else. So. Okay, so the question is, I'll uh, summarize it as it's related to how, how much complexity in, in failure scenarios does um, having remote buffers uh, into ZFS uh, introduce? And the answer is quite a bit. Um, I think this is probably one of the areas we have explored the least, so I, I'm not saying this is ready for production. Um, we, we certainly have found some edge cases where right now it's basically, this is gonna be a failure mode that we haven't been able to handle yet, so right now we're gonna return EIO, for example. Um, but that, that is a great observation that this certainly introduces a lot of complexity in terms of how you handle errors and, and where a buffer is or if it's even retrievable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I think, yep, Jasper commented on, on one of them. So if, if you have a, a buffer inside of an accelerator and that accelerator dies or gets taken out of a system um, and, and you don't have the original buffer sitting somewhere or the, the uncompressed buffer sitting somewhere. Um, because as you, well, we didn't really talk about this, maybe Jason will, um, but the ZFS pipeline, once data lands in the arc, we acknowledge that the data has been written um, because the, the old pipeline didn't have these remote issues. So um, that, that is one, one example. It's, it's an extreme example, but it is one example. 
Right, and so that's a great point, is that for, for our specific workload, we're... Just repeat the question. Oh, sorry, sorry. So, so Gary says, um, for our specific workload, um, we are our right semantic and, and our... Um, the, the process through which the workload goes, it, it's not as big of a deal for us. So we can, we can throw away one set of rights and it's not a huge deal. Uh, I realize that's not true for every single workload, but it certainly is for ours. Um, so, so obviously it expands it. I think. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, summarizing the question. So, uh, the question is, if we didn't acknowledge um, the right when it landed in the DPU, if we waited for the entire pipeline to finish, how that would impact performance? Um, so, yeah, I, I would certainly um, impact performance uh, probably significantly. I, I don't know that we have a good way to quantify it. Although, um, when you're talking about these network speeds and then these NVMe speeds, it's still going to be fast and probably faster than disk, but um, you're certainly stalling the application while it's waiting for you to acknowledge it, right? So the question is, uh, how big would the buffer be that we're uh, allocating on the buffer or on the ABOF before we're actually doing the data calculations or, or movements? Uh, and I believe in this case, uh, Dom can correct me if I'm wrong, it was one megabyte uh, for the block sizes. And that's the typical, I think, the default for ZFS. But it really could be anything. It's, it's definable. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Thank you very much.